to the uh, fans forum here at the Liberty Stadium that's hosted by the Swansea City Supporters Trust. Just give me one second. I will set up nicely for that in my work. So it does give me great pleasure this evening to host the meal, which only by two gentlemen I'll introduce to you in a second, who is attending their first forum since they gained majority control of the club last summer. Uh, when we first raised the idea of this forum, it was our intention to invite all the shareholders of the club, but as the day grew closer, we made a conscious decision as a trust to keep the invite list much smaller for a very simple purpose. That purpose, as we don't see tonight, is a look back on the happened with the share sale. We've had those discussions. You as your members have had the chance to give us your views on how you'd like to proceed. Um, I guess they're aware of those views, and they are aware of what we're currently doing in terms of representing those views to them. What we see tonight as is your chance as trust members to get across your views, concerns and ideas on how we can proceed as a club both on and off the pitch. I think it's fair to say, without putting too many words into the mouths of others, that the last couple of seasons have been a disappointment to us as Swans fans, but we failed to build success the previous season and the joys of winning a major trophy and competing once again on the European stage. You will have seen in recent months and evidenced by both the appointment of Paul Clement and our activity in the January transfer window that we are building a working relationship with the other major shareholders in the club and that is key at this point to ensure that we can do all we can to retain our Premier League status at the end of the season and this forum tonight is simply the next stage of that working relationship. We took the decision to just limit the trust forum uh, to the forum for just trust members purely because we felt demand would be high and it was only right that you all as members of the Trust got the first opportunity to raise questions and hear directly from the majority owners of the club. You will see the press are in attendance this evening, that's at the request of both us and Steve and Jason, and this is so that nothing is shared in the room tonight. It's a secret and there can be no accusations of retaining the answers in a closed shop environment. The format of the evening will follow our tried and trusted method of people putting their hands in the air and asking the question, and then the guests on the top table alongside me will do what we can to answer those questions for you. There's been no pre screening of questions, and we're here to answer any questions you put towards the panel. All we ask is we retain the civility and constructiveness that we always see at these events. So just to take you through the panel, uh, I'm going to go with the right. Stuart Will has sat the wrong way around as I've written it, but they never got told that, so I apologise. Um, I'll start with Stuart. Stuart's in the blue jumper. Stuart was appointed as Trust Supporter Director last October. He's worked hard to build a strong relationship with the club board in his six months in situ. He's a long-standing Trust Board member. He's also our current Treasurer, and he'll be known by many as you as the father-in-law of the drummer in the East Stand. He's been a long-standing season ticket holder and the North Bank before it. Will right down the end, he's another long-standing Trust Board member, and is, as well as being my vice chairman, the title of Associate Director of the City, and he works very closely alongside Stuart and myself to ensure that the Trust has a strong presence in the football club on a daily basis. He's another long-term season ticket holder, and he can usually be found in the West Stand on match days, but I can confirm he doesn't like the prawn sandwich. Okay. In the middle of the table, we've got Steve Kaplan. Um, Steve, as well as his interest in Swansea City, he's the co-executive chairman and shareholder of the Memphis Gri Grizzlies MBA franchise and founder of Oak, Oak Tree Capital Management, a global asset management firm based in Los Angeles. He was appointed as director of Swansea City shortly after the share purchase was completed last July and he's been a frequent visitor to Swansea ever since. Finally, we've got Jason. Uh, we first met Jason about a year ago prior to the to Chelsea. A former lawyer, he's now the general manager and owner at MLS franchise DC United and he's also held stakes in the Philadelphia 76ers and the Memphis Grizzlies, highlighting his passion for professional sport and desire to drive teams forward. Like Steve, he's also a frequent visitor to Swansea and a director of the board of our football club. That's the introductions over and done with. We've got Ian and somewhere wandering around with microphones. So if anybody would like to kick the evening off with a question, this is normally where it goes quiet completely for about 10 seconds, but I'm not going to get the joy tonight, so I think it's coming down this way. And then we'll go over to the centre. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, the recruitment and retention over the last probably 24 months um, at the club has been at best haphazard, at worst negligent. Um, I appreciate you weren't involved in the club for the majority of that time, 
but what can you say that you've put in place, what structures have you put in place to ensure that the, the future recruitment and retention of players um, will certainly be an improvement in what we've seen over the last couple of years? Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone for, for coming out here this evening. Um, it means a great deal to Steve and I to, to get in front of all of you uh, to talk about the club, uh, something that you're obviously very passionate about, that we are very passionate about, uh, seeing it succeed. And just the opportunity to meet many of you here tonight uh, is a real honor and a privilege. And, and so I want to say thank you uh, for taking the time to be here tonight and to talk with us. In terms of your question, uh, certainly one of the things that really attracted us to the club uh, and that we found uh, very impressive was the, the long history of success. Um, and I think you're right, there have been some uh, stumbles along the way, and certainly in the last 18 to 24 months, there have been player acquisitions and, and um, transfer windows that haven't been as successful as they had been before. Um, and so one of the things that I think my partner Steve is very good at um, is, is, is working on best practices and the process by which decisions are made. And I will tell you, I think there's a tremendous amount of talent that I've seen in the club, starting with our chairman, Hugh Jenkins, uh, towards our scouts and our personnel folks, in addition to our coaching staff. Uh, but tightening up the process by which we make decisions, adding new voices to that process and making those decisions, including looking at statistics and analytics in addition to old-fashioned traditional scouting, uh, working all of that together and making the decisions for players is something that we think is very important. And our first transfer window, which was January, uh, we were certainly led very ably by, by Hugh um, and the rest of the staff, uh, but Steve and I certainly got very involved um, and uh, we communicated quite often, I did, with Phil uh, and Stuart about our plans and our strategy. And I thought that uh, generally we were, we were in the midst of a very difficult moment, certainly. Um, and that's, I think, a bit of an understatement. And I, I think the process uh, was a, a better process that we think we helped to improve it. I think it's gonna get better and stronger as we move forward. Um, I think some of the decisions that were made in January are ones that are positive for the club, not only for the, for the, for the remainder of this season, but hopefully into the future. Um, but it's something we're gonna have a very keen eye towards because for the club to continue to succeed, the competition is only getting stiffer and smarter. And we've got to get smarter and look for where we can have a competitive advantage, what kinds of players we can add. And, and we spent time today at Fairwood, the opening, the official opening of the new first team training facility. And I can tell you that it's world class, that it's very impressive, and that goes a long way with players. My, my background, uh, something that Phil didn't mention, is that I, 10 years prior, had been a player agent and I had represented professional athletes. And I looked at what choices they had and advised them on where they wanted to continue their careers, where they could maximize their income, where they could maximize their opportunity to play uh, and win. And I will tell you that facilities like Fairwood attract world-class players. So I was excited to see what they built and the investment that was made prior to Steve and I's arrival. Uh, but I think that's gonna help us in growing our talent base at the academy level, into the first team, and attracting first-team players. <coughs> Just to uh, add a little bit to what Jason said, and, and you mentioned that I like to look at best practices. So I like to ask a lot of questions. I, I probably have asked a lot of the same questions you've thought about to our, our own scouts, to our own people who are, who are making football decisions. Um, why this player? Why that player? What did we look at? What did we consider? Um, you know, and, um, and sometimes I get answers I like and sometimes I don't. I also like to look at what other organizations do who have been successful. What, what do they do that's made them successful? Why are, why are they good? And, and, and that's a discovery process. And we've been in that, in that discovery process. And we're trying, um, and we're at the first stages of putting in place systems within our recruitment process that we think are best practices. For example, um, and and you, you probably are, are all heard we, we're using some analytics now. We have uh, we have a gentleman da named uh, Dan Altman uh, who is a uh, who's a PhD professor who does a, a lot of analysis, statistical analysis. It's highly complex statistical analysis. It's not how many goals were scored. It's it's ball progression.
fresh air, and it's, it's a lot of things go into it. And in American sports, there's been a lot of use of analytics and things like baseball. We're a long way away in football from having great analytics. We're at the very beginning. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be using it. And, and how can we use the analytics? Well, one way is we can identify players that we may not otherwise consider to take a look at. Not to be the decision maker, but there's a player playing in, a, in another league that has that's showing great analytics. Analytics that are consistent with the type of football we play. But we otherwise wouldn't have looked at that player. So now we need to put eyeballs on that player. We need to get scouts looking at, uh, at that player. Then we've, we've got to assess, well, what are our scouts doing? Who is, who is judging, who's judging the judges? Right? How are our scouts doing? How are we assessing our own scouts? Um, do we have more than one scout look at every player before we we're ready to make a decision? How many people look at that player? What kind of report do, do they have? Are the, are, the, are the kinds of reporting that they're doing on you know, certain players different than on other players? How can we systematically get that so it's consistent? That is not a guarantee that we're going to be right all the time. What we can do is increase our likelihood of being right. And, and it's, it's really important, uh, particularly for a club like ours that's not one of the big six clubs. Um, we can't paper over mistakes by just spending more money. We've, we've got to be a little bit better. And that's what we're trying to do. I'd be nice to play nice, so it's not off by saying good evening, gentlemen. Um, I'm in the play and I shall keep it short. Ever since you appeared on the scene, one of the disappointments of the fact that for you patronised us as fans, never at any point have you told us what the real plans are for this club, how you aim to deliver them, what you're going to invest, and what terms and investment is going to be in. You'll be here for two, three, five years. We've been here for decades, and we're going to be here for decades to come. We want to make sure that the club survives long after you've gone. So I'm asking you now, this is your opportunity. Lay a business plan in front of us. Tell us how you were going to invest in Swansea City and what it means for us. Thank you for the question and uh, for the candor. Um, I will say that we, our intentions are very pure um, and that we care a great deal about the club, that we, we understand that we are custodians of the club for as long as we are here, we want to improve things. Uh, we, we, we have a, taken a long-term view of what that means. Um, we are making investments in the club, we're adding on this, we talked about already on the football side, the kind of scouting process we go through, uh, different personnel to help make those decisions alongside of some of the people who are already here leading that, that charge. We've made investments already on the commercial side, uh, bringing in some new leadership to look at ways to grow revenue because our opportunities on the commercial side here, which we felt has a lot of potential with a, with a club like Swansea, will allow us to invest more in players. And that's a sustainable future for the club. Um, I'm not gonna sit here tonight and say we just wanna throw loads of money at the club and have the club lose a lot of money or put the club in debt by, by doing that because I don't think that's a sustainable model for the long-term future of this club and the success that it can have over a long period of time. What I will say is that we believe that Swansea City Football has not seen its best yet and the best days are to come that with our sweat and our time and our energy alongside of you as our partners, we can see a better day and even a brighter future. And that's gonna come from hard work. It's not, there's no simple switch that we're gonna pull. We did not come here to buy the club and flip it six months later or one year later and make a profit. We came here to add value. Um, Steve and I both have an experience, not just as investors, but as operators and trying to make a difference. And what we saw here was a club that had tremendous potential, that had already had great success over the last 14 or 15 years, but one where we were hoping we could add some value. Um, we believe that monetizing 
our business operations, the revenue, the brand of the club, um, this stadium in a better way um, is going to allow us to invest more in players and be more competitive. Um, we're certainly spending time already looking at the opportunity for stadium expansion. Why would we do that? Well, the rules that are set up now allow us, if we get more revenue from selling more tickets, two things happen. Number one, we can bring more people in this community to experience Swansea City football than can do that right now. Number two, is we can take that revenue from more season ticket holders and put it back into players and invest in the club's future. So we see this as a long-term investment. We see this as an opportunity for us to try to add value alongside the existing stakeholders who care so deeply about the club. We understand that our role is really as a custodian of the club. There's no real owner of Swansea City Football. And you're right, the club will be here and hopefully in much better shape long after Steve and I are no longer here or have departed uh, this world. And we're hopeful that we can make an impact while we're here and in a positive way. And one of the things that's so essential for us is being in a place like here tonight to speak with you face to face and tell you from our heart and from our own viewpoint what we want to do to help this club move forward. And not only to answer your questions, but to listen to your comments because you've been stakeholders of this club for a lot longer than before we got here. And we understand that and recognize that. And we want to get your viewpoints and understand your perspective so that we can all grow this thing together. And, and really, I believe everyone in this room has the same vision, the same goals for the club, which is to see it succeed, to see it thrive in a sustainable way, um, and to have success and, and, and grow with the club. Right, I've heard about all the plans for the future and expanding the club and we want to have more value and everything. Right, I'm just harking back to the 11 weeks disaster we had with Bob Bradley. And who in their wisdom was the person who appointed him? Because that's one of the most disastrous terms we've had in Swansea City Football Club. We were the laughing stock of the Premier League. If he hadn't been here for that 11 weeks, we wouldn't be counting every point now coming to the end of the season. And who were the people responsible for appointing him? Well, what I will say about, about uh, the managerial decision is that uh, we took that decision. I take responsibility for that decision. Um, we, we, it was our first 60 days as owners of the club, and we were there was a decision made internally in our boardroom among all of us that we were going to make a managerial change, and we took decisive action. And for 85 days, we saw the action play out, and we worked very closely with the manager and the manager's staff, and the boardroom worked closely together. And when we realized that we needed to make another change, once again, we took decisive action. And, but that responsibility falls on us. We, we made decisions that we thought were in the best interest of the club, and when we realized that there may be an opportunity to do something swiftly to move forward in a different direction, we did that. And I will tell you this, we will do our best to make decisions that benefit the club. And we're gonna certainly make mistakes and we're certainly gonna do things that aren't in the club's best interest, but it will always be with the best intentions and with a lot of thought given to those decisions. Um, but when we, we recognize we need to make a change, we're gonna be decisive in doing so. The thing is, the fans could see after three weeks, that he wasn't the manager. You know, he had somebody like Lorente on the bench, who we could all see was a footballer. You know, we've watched football for years. I've been a Swansea City fan for 45, 46 years. I could see that what he was doing, I, I mean, the man did, I, might have been a nice person, but he just did not have the knowledge a football at all. So I could not see why every week we were just getting worse and worse. So I just couldn't see why it was going on. I know he 
85 days, but it was 85 days, ruined our season. Well, well two things I'll say. Um, is number one is that prior to Bob's arrival, uh, the team was really struggling. So uh, I won't, I won't, I won't put it all. I wouldn't put it all in that 85 day period. Uh, we we came into a situation uh, where Steve and I arrived at the club uh, basically in August when the season was about to start, and a few games into the season, there was a decision that was made that hey, we need to change managers, and. Uh, it all happened pretty quickly for us. And as we talked about, we, we, we do care deeply about having the right process and making decisions. Um, but we also believe in being decisive. And um, when we recognize, as I said, after 10 or 11 matches, that it wasn't working, not only with the, the previous manager, but also with our second manager this season, uh, we made a swift decision to change again. And, and I, I think that, um, Starting in 2017, thus far, um, yes, we've had some ups and downs, but I think things are moving in a positive direction for the club since, since January. Thank you. Um, talk about stadium expansion. I was just wondering if we do it, where's the money going to come from? Because if we take it out of the playing budget, as we've seen where we underinvested in the team, um, we're obviously struggling. So if we do that again, if we do obviously stay up, then my opinion is we definitely go down. So is the money going to come from outside of the playing budget if uh, that's what we decide to go down? <laughs> I, I didn't realize there was an open bar. I think I might have a beer. If <laughs> so so that's, that's a very good question. It's something we're, we're spending time thinking about. Certainly we believe that our opportunity to grow commercial revenue um, and expand the club means bring, bringing in more fans at some point. And so we're interested in that process. Um, we, we certainly are not, we're laser focused on investing in, in, the, in the players on the club and, and the football team. And so anything that's gonna take away from that is something that we're, we're not interested in doing because we know that our success on the pitch is, is critical. And we do have, uh, folks in our club who are looking at the stadium expansion. And we're going to try to figure out, obviously the rules allow us, as we grow revenue from a stadium expansion, to put more money into the club. So so our ability to expand the stadium will actually allow us to fund uh, more player transactions. And that's that's our hope. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, the first step is we've got to get control of the stadium. Uh, that's a work in process. It's a complex negotiation. But we're working on it uh, on a uh, on almost a daily basis. Um, there are rules in the Premier League that limit our how much money we can invest in players. They're called financial fair play rules. To the extent we can do a stadium expansion and grow our revenue, we can invest. More, we're allowed by the rules to invest more money in players. In addition, if we do a stadium expansion, uh, it's possible we'll be able to bring in additional commercial revenue through additional advertising revenue help pay for it. But the first part of the process is we've got to get control of the stadium because under the current structure, uh, a, a, a stadium expansion deal is, is, is impossible. So that's that's our first step. That's our first focus. Hi. Can you hear? Thank you for coming, gentlemen. It can't uh, be easy to face us, I suppose, but uh, the future of this club is you and us all working together. Uh, Jason, you said that you're the long-term custodians of the stakeholders. And, and as we know, and the lady before spoke, uh, how long most of us have been here, quite a lot of us know quite a bit about football. Um, what I think would be a good thing is uh, the trust helped save this club when we were You've heard the history with Tony Betty and people like that. Uh, the trust did a lot of work, but now our 22% stake hold is actually not worth very much. To prove this cemented this relationship between the supporters and the board, is it not possible for us to have this 25% stake hold, which is showing you, you, you really are with us? So, so 
I think it's important, um, as much as we want to look forward tonight, to at least talk a little bit about the transaction that had us investing in the club and to give you some clarity from our perspective on, on what happened and how we see that moving forward. And what I will say is when we first learned of the opportunity to invest in Swansea City Football Club, uh, we met with some of the shareholders, not including the trust. And we were told at that time that for us to proceed with the transaction quietly and to discuss the terms of that transaction, we should not, just, we should not engage with the trust. And we got to a point in March of 2016 where we certainly we needed to be respectful of that because we weren't shareholders of, of the company and uh, needed to respect the shareholders we were looking to acquire their shares whose shares we were looking to acquire. In March of 2016, uh, we first met with uh, the trust representative, and um, we had, I had met uh, the trust representative before, but I, uh, but I had not disclosed that we were interested in potentially investing. Um, I say all this to, to tell you that this has been quite a, a process and a learning experience and a relationship building experience for myself and for Steve and, the, and, and as new investors. And during the course of the last six or eight months, as we've gotten to know Phil better and Stuart better and Will, um, we, we've started discussions with them about how we work best together. And initially, I think we didn't get off to the best start. Um, we had to make some changes, um, as we did with, with, with players and the manager. And there were, I think there were some suspicion on both sides about how we best communicate and whether we were being authentic and open in our dialogue with each other. I will say, and I want to commend Phil and Stu for their efforts in reaching out to us and uh, our, hopefully we've reciprocated that. And over the last six months or so, I think we've really started to build a stronger working relationship. And the trust has increased between us. And I think that's going to be critical. Whether the trust owns 22% of this club or 40% of the club or 10% of the club. Um, what's most important is that we, for us, is that we have a strong, engaged working relationship, that we are transparent with the trust representatives about our perspective on things, that they're included in the decision making, as I believe they were in our most recent managerial decision, um, in the transfer windows, in growing uh, the business side of the club and the commercial operations of the club. So we sat down um, and in January, maybe December or January, and we agreed that we would have further dialogue with the trust about percentage of shareholdings, about how we move forward together after we spent this full season together. And we've seen how we work together and how we communicate with each other. And as that relationship has gotten better and better, uh, we've agreed that we're going to continue that talk. So we're, we're open-minded about how we move forward. Uh, we want to be very good partners um, with the trust, with, with our largest partner in, in this endeavor. Um, and we want it to be something where uh, over time, uh, we don't always agree with each other, certainly. Um, we, we certainly will have those disagreements and we'll air them in, in open, honest dialogue together. Uh, but we want to foster a strong relationship. Well, you know, that's, I'm glad you want to hear, have that um, dialogue with us. And Phil has kept us informed. There has been a much improved and vital relationship. I mean, there is a cultural difference between soccer in the UK and soccer in America. I mean, your franchises go from city to city. You probably heard it happen once here with MK Dons, and it will never happen again. So we are here for life, you know. What is the problem of, of what sticks in the garden of a lot of us is that we were known as a community club and a SARP or fraud club rising from the fourth tier to the Premier League and getting established. And our original directors had a, a huge part in that, and we're grateful for it. But really, they sold out for a, one hell of a lot of cash. And they're now still retaining shares when the trust need 2.6 more shares, 2.6% more shares, that, that, that we're here forever. Why, why can't you enable that simple action that we could get 25% of the shares? I don't want to speak for the other current shareholders about what their, their views are and holding on to their shares. I believe that some of those who, who held on to shares did so because they believe 
in continuing to be a part of the club and continuing to have a stake in it. Um, and I and the difference between 22% and 15% or 25% of ownership, uh, I'm not a, a, a barrister. Um, I don't know British law, corporate law, um, but you know I do know that the trust is the second largest shareholder of this club, and they're vital in more ways than that to the success of this club, and that if we're going to succeed or fall, we're going to do it together, and we want to succeed together. Um, and that we, I believe that if we all lock arms, the folks in this room who care so passionately about the club, the leadership who's sitting up here uh, with us tonight, that we're going to have long-term success. And uh, so the, to answer your question directly, I don't, I don't know the particulars of the percentage interest sitting up here tonight. What I do know is that you've got the two largest shareholders of the club in this room, and that's us and the Supporters Trust. And we all want to see this club succeed. And we all want to continue to see it grow and thrive. Um, and it, it's a ruthless sport we're in. Um, and we, we outplayed, I thought, our opponent on Sunday. And in the final seconds, we got fortunate that uh, they didn't head the ball in to beat us. Um, and if we're not aligned, everyone in this room, if we don't believe in each other together, if we don't have each other's backs together, um, then we can't, be as, we can't reach our potential. And so I, I'm, I'm up here tonight sitting with Phil and with Stu and with Steve and with Will, and I, I feel as though we can have a bright future and that future can be brightest uh, if we all focus on our goals, our common goals and our common objectives. Hi there, good evening. Um, with regard to investment, I'd just like to know who are the people that originally contributed to the 70 million buyout of um, the previous shareholders? There seems a bit of lack of clarity or transparency as to who the other sort of partners within your um, takeover um, team were. Yeah, I am. I'm. Uh, I'm the largest shareholder, um, and Jason's the second largest shareholder, and we have complete control over our ownership group. The uh, the other two largest shareholders uh, are members of the uh, members of the board, Romy Chowdhury and Bobby Heinrich. Uh, the remaining shareholders are small shareholders. They're actually limited partners. They have no, essentially no rights. Uh, they're largely friends of mine and Jason, who are private people, uh, who made modest investments alongside us because they're friends of ours. Um, that's it. There's no, there's no foreign government or interest or, it's us. Um, so, and, um, um, you know, if, you, if, if any of you would come to Santa Monica, I'd invite you to my house. Um, I have a, uh, he's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm serious. Um, I have a, for the, for the matches that I'm not here for, I have watch parties. Uh, my friends who put some money in alongside, and, and it's, you know, relatively modest amounts, um, come to the watch parties and we watch, we watch the games together. And um, they know not to speak to me during the matches because I'm way too stressed out. Um, um, believe me, we are living and dying with every one of these matches. Um, and we, we all are. We all are. And that's, you know, it, indeed, that's part of the beauty of this sport. Um, it's not fair sometimes. Um, there's, there's serendipity involved. Um, there's, it's beautiful. Um, and there's no certainty of result. And you can outplay a team and play better football and not win. And a referee can make a decision, uh, which, all, which all seem to go against us. I think we can all agree on that, which, which I don't know if that's been true in, in years past. But I don't think we've gotten a call in our favor yet this year. We, we're, I think we're, we're owed one. But um, that's who we are. There's no hidden agenda. There's no, there's no big secrets here. Hi, guys. I'd like to reiterate what was said earlier. Um, thanks for coming along and facing the music, as it were. I'm sure it can't be easy. Anyway, um, I was interested in your replies to a previous question from Steve in the back. And I don't think you actually answered it. You talked about the fact that you wanted to expand the stadium and it was a complicated process in securing the control of the stadium before you could do that. But Steve asked you where the money was going to come from. The reason I, I wanted to push you on this is that um, I think some of your problems have come from the fact that previous to tonight you haven't actually 
directly communicated with the fans. And I think this will go a long way to improving that. But there's all sorts of rumours that us fans hear about, oh, the transfers in January, we, the club had to take out a loan, you know, to cover some of those costs. Well, if you're investing, surely we shouldn't be taking loans out. Maybe that's not true. But the fact he didn't directly answer the question sort of gets me a bit nervous. So, I appreciate your follow-up question because I, I maybe I wasn't as clear as I wanted to be. So thank you for, for following up. When we invested in the club, we put zero debt on our acquisition. So we didn't want to leverage the club. We didn't want to put any debt on the club because our long-term goal for the club is financial stability, continued financial stability. And there are a lot of investments that are made in sports clubs around the world where the investor comes in and says, well, I'll put up 10% of the capital and I'll borrow the rest against the club. And then you see the dangers in that. So we didn't do that at all. We put zero debt on the club when we made the investment. Certainly, we have a variety. One of the reasons I think I wasn't as clear in my answer is because we have a variety of options when, when it comes to stadium expansion. Um, and the focus of those options is going to be what is going to put the club in the best shape going forward. Um, certainly, we believe the demand is there for the, the additional seats so that that will allow us to build. We wouldn't build, we wouldn't include, increase the capacity of the stadium unless we felt that fans were, more fans wanted to come. So we'll have options in, in, in how we invest in the, in the club, but I can tell you what I wanted to say was most important is that one of the key advantages to expanding the stadium is the increased revenue that we can then put into more players. So what we recognize is that the heart and soul and the bread and butter of this club is its, its squad and, and, and the, the squad having success on the pitch. And so everything we do is not to take away resources from that, it's to put more resources toward it. But in having financial stability long term, those resources aren't going to come from outside investment and losing money. They're going to come from the club growing its own revenues and reinvesting those revenues into success on the pitch. Okay, I might want to add something because I want to make sure that everybody understands the, the question on debt. We, we, and, and Jason was correct, we didn't borrow any money to make an investment in the club. We didn't borrow against the club's assets. This is not what people refer to as a leveraged buyout. It's not, there's, there's zero debt. We do have a credit line because we get paid from the media rights from the Premier League three times a year. So in between those three times a year, when we get these large lump sum media rights payments, we have to pay all of our bills. Player, but primarily player, salary, player salaries, but everything else. So in the interim between those payments, we do a short, we do a short term borrowing like every, every club, every business. We have a short term borrowing line where we, we borrow for those expenses until that Premier League payment comes in and then it's immediately paid down to zero. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify that as, as well. Hi guys, first of all, welcome to Wales, welcome to Swansea, and uh, perhaps I'm not like there's a lot of people in the room and I might get bored from my, some of my comments, but um, first of all, uh, uh, just to hop back on a couple of points, I think most of the people in this room have um, slagged off the previous owners over the last 24 months. I can't see anybody in here under the age of uh, 16 to 20, every single person had the option of £50,000 a club all that time ago. You come in, bought them out, good luck to them. Oh, don't do this, take me off. <laughs> um, since you've come in, to be fair, I think you've shouldered a lot of blame for what's gone on over the last sort of 24, 26 months. Um, as where I sit, um, you've invested a lot of money into the club. Perhaps people don't see Lionel Messi on the football field. They don't see Cristiano Ronaldo on the football field. But I don't think they understand how much money this has already cost you before. You know, you're moving forward, let's hope that we can progress on that and go a little bit. Um, the only thing, like I'm more of a football boy, so the only thing I'm a little bit sort of skeptical on is this analytical computer thing of yours. Um, we put Michael Loud up in charge to the years ago. Um, people signed for the club, for Michael Loud up. Let's not make no bones about it, they didn't sign for Swansea City. 
And then we moved on to Gary Monk, who probably wasn't known much on CITLA. And then we moved on to Bob Bradley, who probably wasn't known much on CITFC. But we've now got um, Paul Clement in charge, who I think we go back to the line of um, Michael Laudrup of the knowledge that guy must have is phenomenal. He's worked under some of the best coaches in the world. He's worked with some of the biggest clubs in the world. So surely we should be typing into his head rather than into a computer keyboard. He must know people that are in Bayern Munich's reserve team, Real Madrid's reserve team. Admittedly, the wages might be a little bit high on them. But surely she should be typing into his head rather than a computer keyboard and um, picking up the talent that way. Yeah, since, since, since I was the one who spoke about the analytics, I'll, I'll take a first shot at it. And, and I just want to be clear, the analytics are not a replacement for what Paul Clement can bring to the table. And Paul is very much involved, integrally involved. In fact, we had a three-hour meeting with, with Paul as part of planning for the summer. I don't want to take too much of this time because we've, we've got a really important match tomorrow night. Um, but yes, Paul's contacts and relationships are important, not only his contacts with specific players, but when we identify a player, he undoubtedly, in, in, in many cases already, uh, will be able to reach an assistant coach from, from that club who will be able to say, yeah, I know that, I know that lad, and he's really, he's, he's, he's great, and he's a real leader, and he's gonna fight on a 50-50 ball. Or he might say, you know, that's not a guy we want. That's not someone who's gonna put their heart and soul in, not someone who we're gonna want in Swansea. The analytics don't tell us any of that. Paul Clement's relationships are gonna inform a lot of that. And it, to the extent I suggested that that wasn't critically important in, in the decision making and Paul wouldn't be integrally involved, then I misspoke. What the analytics allows us to do is have another check, to have another thing to look at to help us make sure we're not making a mistake because mistakes are too costly for a club like ours. Well, the way I would, I would phrase it is that Let's say we've got eight football people in the room who have decades of experience and they're sitting around a table and we're saying, do we want Martin Olsen? Can we get him? Do we want him? You know, can we, is he an important add to the club? Well, now we've just pulled up a ninth chair and it's someone who's saying, well, let me look at the data and, and, and give my opinion as one ninth of this decision making and help, help, help be a part of the discussion. But the eight people who were there with the decades of experience, they're still sitting there. And it's just we're adding another voice to that debate and discussion. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to Wales' only Premier League club. Um, for, you've touched upon the stadium issue. Just a couple of points really related to the transport surrounding that. You'll have no doubt noticed how difficult it is. We're wedged in here with 21,000 in the stadium. And there's going to be some difficulties in transport and everything else. Is that part of your plans as well? And secondly, are you in any position to sort of indicate whether we've got eight games to go now? If we do go down our state, our capacity, we're going to get 13, 14,000 coming through the door instead of 21 next season if we are. Take that other route. Hopefully, everyone in this room uh, says no. So, uh Number one, yeah, number one about the parking instance and the transport. Uh, it's certainly a bit a part of our plans. Uh, we had a meeting today uh, with our team, our staff, to discuss that issue. Uh, so we're well aware that any discussion around the stadium, any discussion with the council, uh, with the other stakeholders, it's important that, that folks can get here and get out of here after matches. Um, and that there's a, a better process and a better opportunity to do that. So I, I appreciate that, that issue and it's something we know, uh, I've heard quite a bit about. Um, your second part of the question, I don't remember. <laughs> something about the relegation, is that what you said? Yeah, saying uh, the strategy, are we going to go ahead and expand the stadium if we're going to go down to the next level? And is that part of the plan you're looking at? A plan A, plan A, hopefully, we'll be here next season, Premier League. Well, I will tell you this. We, we have no intention of changing leagues next year. Uh, and uh, everyone in this room is focused on that. 
but our plans for the stadium are long term and our plans for the club are long term and we're going to endure challenges along the way so we're not looking to change the stadium with an eye only towards next season uh, we're looking to make changes with an eye towards a longer term future than that certainly and so yes we're going to have to factor in all the risks associated with where this club is next year and the year after and the year after that um, but we're not going to make a decision only with with one one season in mind on learning so quickly that you've got us a very good uh, coach now. Uh, congratulations on Lorente. But what about the other 15 million bench warm we've got? What's, what's his future? You know, I just thought that you'd try to get rid of him in the uh, last uh, window. <laughs> because you seem to just take him around in the coach, put him on the bench wherever you're going, and you know, he's crossed this and So, the other thing, I want to echo what you said just before my turn came. Uh, our top priority is to stay in the league because I've been here for many, many years, and the 14,000, 15,000 is tops if you're in the championship. It just isn't attractive enough. No, the, 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 the area will only bring in new probably 14, 15,000. So any hopes of expanding the uh, stadium is entirely new, focused on uh, staying in the family. And obviously, we all walk the room. Uh, I was here on Saturday, and I agree entirely with your summation. We should have scored a couple of times. We had a handball. <laughs> That's life in Swansea. <laughs> so, overall, thank you, thank you very much for your comments. Um, to answer your question on personnel, I think that uh, there were some investments made certainly prior to our arrival and upon our arrival that were very good ones, and there were certain ones that haven't quite worked out yet, certainly. Um, I think. Certainly, we had higher expectations for Borja Baston, who I believe you're referring to when, when he first arrived. Um, he's still a, quite a young player, and he certainly showed the ability to put the ball in the back of the net when playing in Spain. Uh, he hasn't had a tremendous amount of opportunity here to play. Um, and when he has played, we haven't gotten what we were hoping to get in those short, short periods of time. But, um, one of the reasons he hasn't had the opportunity to play is that we've been playing Lorente up front, um, and he's been quite productive for us. Um, so the question with Bastogne will, will go on until until the off season, and we're going to have to evaluate what what's our best path towards most efficiently using our resources to, to put up the, on the pitch players who help us win. You know, unfortunately, he did not. <laughs> uh, cheers, guys, for coming tonight. Uh, I have a question about marketing. Uh, there seems to be a big focus about going to America. We know today that we're going on the US tour in the summer there. Uh, we've got the South Korean captain in our squad, Ki Sung Young. I'm just wondering why is there such a focus with America and why are we looking out of the right, wider reaches of the world? Certainly, certainly, Korea is an area that we should and, and will be exploring um, as long as Ki is, is on our squad. 
Um, the reason for the focus on America is it is by far the largest sponsorship market in the world. And the Premier League uh, is growing in America at a very, very rapid clip. Um, ten years ago, even five years ago, um, if I walked around New York City uh, or Los Angeles with my Swansea City hat on, people would just look and say, that's a very nice swan on your hat. Um, everywhere in America I am today and I'm wearing any kind of Swansea gear, people say, oh, Swansea City, you know, how are you guys doing? Or what happened in that last match? It's growing at an incredible rate in the U.S. It's a very powerful market in terms of potential sponsorship dollars. And that's an opportunity for us as a club to, to grow our revenue. So we're going to try and take advantage of that as best we can. But your, your point is a good one. We have uh, we also have a, a player who's of Indian descent. There's a billion people in India. So in, in the future, we're going to be looking at our squad. We're going to be looking at uh, where we can potentially maximize revenue, where we can generate sponsorship dollars. And we're, gonna looking, we're not just going to be looking in the U.S. But we're going to be looking in other parts of the world. <laughs> States, the interest in potentially Korea or China in in, um, in 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 marketing dollars. That's all dependent on being on in the Premier League. Um, you know, the Championship is, is a great league. There's a lot of interest in in the United Kingdom, uh, but not really outside the United Kingdom. It's not a, it's not a, it's not it doesn't have the worldwide interest. So, and the reason it's, it's such a, a good point, such a good question, is our first priority, number one, has got to be performance on the pitch. If we, if we don't perform on the pitch, we could have the greatest ideas. We could hire the greatest marketing people. Um, we could make really nice presentations, and it, and it won't be worth that much. We've got to perform on the pitch. You bet. You bet. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, they, they should know from their contracts because um, most most player contracts have relegation clauses in them. You can always get one, one possibly two bad players on the bench, but when it's a whole team, there's something wrong somewhere. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to say this about our, our squad. I think we've got a, uh, a, a really good group of human beings. Um, you may not always love the way they, they play on the pitch. They're a really good bunch. There's not a, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a, bad seed among that group. Um, they're really, really, really good lads. And, and, and Jason and I have gotten to know quite a few of them. Um, and um, they're, they're gentlemen. Uh, maybe sometimes gentlemen on, on the pitch. And maybe there are times when they, you know, we need to, you know, a little bit more fire. Um, but um, but it's, it's, they're, they're really, really good lads. And, uh, and I'm proud of that. Well, thank you, Steve. Is there a question now, uh, gentlemen, the back of the hall? I feel like I'm repeating what's already been asked, but with regards to the stadium expansion, it's not going to happen. We are staying up, but, and you just said that it's all dependent on whether we stay in the Premier League or not. If it does go down, you're not going to get the revenue to invest the way that you want to invest because you're not going to get the ticket sales. So how are you going to invest in the squad strengthening? Are you going to do the parachute payments? How are you going to invest if that does happen? Because it's all well and good saying that we aren't, but if, what, what happens then? What happens next? Because you're saying that you're going to expand the stadium and you're going to get more revenue from ticket sales, but if that doesn't happen, then how, how are you going to invest in it? It's a good question. So, first of all, I think you're absolutely right that our opportunities for growing our commercial revenue are going to be dramatically hindered at any time that we're, we're not no longer in the Premier League, whether it's next year, the year after that, or beyond. So, 
what we've spent a lot of time discussing is um, our movements in the in the event that we are relegated this year or any year in the future. How do we optimize our resources? And that's going to mean being very strategic about the parachute payments, being very strategic about the players under contract on our roster, figuring out who are the players we need to add and maybe some of the players who need to leave us. Um, and we're going to pour our attention and our focus and our resources into getting back up. And that's, that's going to be our primary focus. So yes, there's great opportunity here from commercial revenue expansion. This is a club that spent the last six years in the Premier League. But we've got to succeed, as Steve said, on the pitch. And if we are no longer in the Premier League, our primary and our secondary and our tertiary focus is going to be getting back there and figuring out the kinds of player decisions that, that can be made to do that. And I will say this, I will give credit to members of our staff and our team and our leadership like Hugh Jenkins who got us here in the first place because it's an unbelievable track record of success that this club had for a, a long period of time. And there were many people that were important in that success. Uh, and many of those people are still with us. So we've got a great deal of knowledge and knowledge base to, to draw from and leadership to draw from. Um, but we're going to use all the tools in our toolkit to get back up to the Premier League in the unfortunate event that we're relegated. Uh, good evening. There's something you've said that, that worries me. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying that the previous board of directors did a fantastic job getting us to where we were and getting us into the Premier League. But it's been alluded to several times tonight how the decisions that have been made in recent years, particularly on the player recruitment front, have been nothing short of appalling. You then went on to say that um, these shareholders, the, the leading players in this board of directors, approached you and specifically asked you to exclude us from that process. You're now saying that They've shown great leadership over recent years. I'm sorry, that doesn't fit with me. If I was in your position, I wouldn't be trusting these people, and yet they're still there. <laughs> in, in any other company, in any other business, if the chief executive and his senior staff had led an organisation in the way that we've been led in the last two or three years, they wouldn't be there. You know, I will say that the, the, first of all, I believe as a third party looking on that it would have been beneficial to engage the supporters trust as a, as a shareholder in the process earlier. That being said, um, you know, the first meeting we had with the trust as shareholders was in March of 2016. Um, and we consummated our transaction for about four or five months later. Um, so there was some period of time where there was dialogue. Um, the, the praise that I gave to the, some of the leadership of the club um, is because I believe over the 12 to 14 year period, in terms of success on the pitch, I think it's very hard to argue with the success this club had and where it came from in the lower leagues, moving, moving rapidly up to the Premier League. We know that story. Jack do a thing. He said he took pictures of our best. We know that story. We know better than anybody. So, so the way that those shareholders have sold the club, and the way that, that you acted in buying it, and for a period after that, is not particularly good. It's not particularly trustworthy, and it's the elephant in the room here tonight. But guys, you really like the lot, and I really want to like you. You're very charismatic, and I really want to believe in you. But still. Every time you ask for some real facts, you're very evasive. Yeah, so what, what facts would you like to know, sir? Now you talk about half and honesty, how can we believe that 
when you excluded the people who would be your main shareholders alongside you. You can't believe that. I mean, you've got a big job to make when you believe that. So, uh, I will say this. I, I would, I, from our perspective, okay, and if you, if you put your, I'm, I'm doing our best, uh, as best as anyone can, to put myself in your shoes. And I understand your frustration and your hurt as best that I can. I didn't experience it, but I, I, I want to do my best to put myself in your shoes. From, in my shoes, I came to a, from a, as an outsider to a club that had a, an exciting history, a lot of potential. Um, I, Steve and I talked about what a great community this was. And we said, wow, what an opportunity this would be for us to invest in this club and grow with the club. And the majority of shares were held by shareholders other than the trust. And there was a chairman, and uh, we engaged with, with, with the shareholders of the, of the club who owned almost 80% of the club. And we went through the processes they thought they, they directed us. Now, so, so number one, what I would say is that we certainly didn't collude with the other shareholders because we had to negotiate with them. They were on the other side of the table, and we had to figure out could we acquire their shares and at what price and what was the role we could play. Um, So, in March of 2016, prior to us having a, 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 a deal with, with any shareholders, we met with the Supporters Trust. In August of 2016, for, uh, the end of July, early August, four or so months later, we consummated uh, a transaction with those shareholders. So, yes, there was a period of time prior to March of 2016 where we were getting to know shareholders, um, and we were around the club, I was learning about the club, learning about its history, learning how it was run. Um, but the first day that we formally told the Supporters Trust that we were interested in acquiring the shares, four months went by before we closed the transaction to buy those shares. So um, it, it, you know, I just want to make sure that, that from our perspective, maybe four months wasn't enough time to communicate with the Supporters Trust prior to investing in the club. Maybe we should have been six months or eight months, um, but we certainly were communicating with the trust prior to making any investment in the club. But you're right today, you've done so much. You've done so much before that, which the trust was excluded from. For instance, we may, in the situation where you may be very nice now, in the situation where we're in, while things are a bit in the air legally, but who knows what will happen in the future from people who excluded the trust. Now, we may have wanted to sell our shares. It may be a position that because we can't do much to affect the club, we could do that just as a fans group and not as shareholders. And we've been disadvantaged because we've not had the opportunity to sell our shares at the price that everyone else has. Because we could put that money aside and maybe save the club in the future if needs be. Well, you went ahead and you know, you say all the right things and I would expect nothing less from the two of you. Um, and that's no insult for everything, but you're going to say the right things, aren't you? But obviously your interest is doing the best with the club that you can, and that's great for us. But you're going to have a get out if things go wrong. And that's when it comes down to us, the trust. But we've been disadvantaged because we weren't given first refusal, for instance, on if we wanted to buy more shares, which was part of the shareholder agreement. And you knew that, didn't you? You knew about the shareholder agreement. So, number one, um, uh, we, as soon as that, that meeting was held with us to trust in March of 2016, um, I met with the lawyers for the trust, and I said, would you all be interested, we're four months away, maybe three months, six months, I didn't know at that time, away from the transaction, would you, are you interested in us acquiring your shares as well? Um, so I did ask that question, and, and there were four months that went by before we consummated a transaction, that's number one. Number two, um, without getting into 
you know, the details that, that as best as I recall them, we were not aware of, of any other arrangement or shareholders agreement um, with, with any other parties. We, we approached the, the, the shareholders to acquire their shares. Um, and when we did that, um, we were not aware of any, any other arrangements uh, binding the parties. So you were totally unaware of the shareholder agreement? You knew nothing of it? It was represented to us that there was no shareholder agreement at the time that we came in to acquire the club. But you knew there was one, but that it was told to you that it wasn't valid. Is that correct? Or are you saying you didn't think there was a shareholder agreement at all? Yes. So you've never heard of a shareholder agreement? So we had heard rumblings that there were different agreements between the parties. We'd never seen the document. And we asked to see it. Sorry, I, I've got to come back. I mean, we seem to have digressed quite a bit from the point that I was trying to make. My point was, the, the people who were leading the board of directors previously, we, we've just talked at length about that and the way they acted. My question to you is, how can you now put faith in those people who have made bad footballing decisions, bad management decisions, and whether it's legally correct or not, they morally was wrong in going to you and asking you to exclude us from the negotiations. How can you put faith in them? That's my question. So, um, number one, I, I, I think there were mistakes made in the acquisition process. And certainly looking back now and knowing some of you all, not all of you, but understanding your perspective, I would have liked to have engaged earlier with, with, with the trust. Um, and so I don't want to speak for the, the shareholders and what their perspective was on that because I don't know exactly. Um, but I do know that for more than a decade, uh, those shareholders led this club to great success, historic success. And that's not fictitious, that's just the facts of, of watching the club and how it rose in the, in the, in the different leagues. So yes, do I think there were mistakes made in the last several transfer windows? Sure, I think there were some big successes as well. I think Alfie Mawson was quite a, quite a find. I think some of the moves that were made in January have worked out quite well. Um, do we think we can improve upon the process of making those player decisions? Yes, and we're hoping that we can do that. That said, I think there's a tremendous track record of success if we look at the body of work over 14 seasons. And uh, in some ways, it's unrivaled. And so I don't want to be hypercritical of a few transfer windows or a few player decisions because if we took the totality, if I said to many people in this room 15 years ago, let me tell you what's going to happen to Swansea City Football Club, the club you love so much, and you're going to rise to the Premier League, you're going to spend six or seven years in the Premier League, um, I think people would be pretty happy with that story. And some of those shareholders who put their sweat and their lives into building this club, I think they deserve some respect for that, regardless of the separating the transaction and the decisions that were made in, the, in our investment in that transaction. They've had about 10 playing games in the they last... They yeah. lost all, I lost all the respect for those people. I lost it all. And I'm not the only one that you know. In the end, that's all they wanted was money. That's all their concern was. And not just the last two or three seasons, the last four or five years of having businesses where they had it, that they held, that they supplied Stormzy City with. It became too corrupt at the end. You know as well as I do that businesses don't succeed on past success. Yes, I, was, I started off by saying that these guys had a fantastic tra track record. Yeah, But when you're making bad decisions, not just on transfers, but all the other things we talked about, for three or four years, something's gone wrong. People get stale. And you know it, probably in other businesses, you'd have had those people out on, your, on their heads. Say, um, you someone mentioned the elephant in the room. Yes, the original board, Hugh Jenkins, did.
did a good job up to a certain time. They think they've taken the club as far as they can. If you had a, a survey of the 16,000 season ticket holders, and they said, do you want you, Jenkins, or any of the other boards still involved, I think we all want a clean break. You know, your businessmen have a much higher level than you, Jenkins, you know. He ran a builder's yard, which went bust, owing a lot of money, owing a lot of tax. Yes, he did a good job, but as people have said, they've taken the money. And, and hats off, that's business. They've made a hell of a lot of money out of this club. But I don't think then being around it or will cement the relationship between the core fans like us who will be here if we do get relegated, and yourselves. I think it's time to make a clean break and, and appoint the chief executive who you think will fit in, in talking to the trust with taking the club forward. Does anybody want to raise a question? Can we do it in order and speak into the microphone and not just uh, shout out? Because part of the room, we can't hear the other part uh, discussing things. Thank you. Question from the gentleman. I don't think there was a question. I think it was a comment. Was a we, we heard it. Yeah. We, we, I, we I heard you taking on board the statement from the gentleman. Good evening, gents. Uh, prior to coming on board, uh, Hugh Jenkins stood up in a forum and said that they felt the board had to sell because they'd taken the club as far as they thought they could and they needed someone to take it to the next level. What do you guys see as the next level and what sort of time frame are you allowing to the chair? So I, I think we've talked about a number of the things that, that we need to do. I think. What you was referring to is that the Premier League is getting more competitive, mm -hmm. not less. That other teams are becoming more sophisticated, not less. That, that the the quality that we need to bring to the table is higher than it's ever than it's ever been. Uh, we've all read about the, the the big numbers in the television deals, worldwide distribution of Premier League rights. Um, Every, every team in the Football Association has set its sights on being in the Premier League. And so how do, we, you know, how do we stay ahead of the game and how do we stay in this league as we're not Manchester City or Manchester United or Liverpool, we're not one of the top, the top six. And we've talked about the things that we think need to be done over the long term to be sustainable. And those things are, we, we need better recruitment. We've got to do a better job of it, no question about it. Two, we've got to build revenue streams so that, so that we can increase the revenue that we have to invest in players and facilities and academy. We need to make our academy, we've got great facilities now. You, you, I, I know a number of you have, have seen the, um, the academy facilities. Uh, the, um, we, we talked earlier about um, uh, creating tours over the summer uh, for the uh, for the training facility we've created. These are world class facilities. Um, we need to continue to build our academy. It's a relatively young academy. We haven't been around as long as Tottenham, which has a number of players on their squad who came through their academy. We have one of their players on our squad, Tom Carroll. Um, but we need to develop our own players, and we need to be better than you know those ninety or, or so other clubs that are envious of us because we're in the Premier League and won our, and won our spot. Um, and you know, there's an expertise that I, hope, that I hope we can bring that can help on a number of these things, particularly on, on, on the commercial side. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, and that, I think that's, and that's where, where we can help. Um, we have a great passion for the sport. We have, we, we have a great passion for this team. And we're sincere. We, we are we're, we're here to leave this club whenever we wind up leaving, and it's going to be a long time, so you're going to be with us for a while. In a better place than when we got here. That's what we need to do. That's, that's our mission. On the subject of improving the revenue, are we looking to uh, get a better shirt sponsor? Are we worth a lot more than Bet East or GWX or whatever the last one was? Yes. I have to be careful. We have a contract with Ben. Well, I really right? understand this point. So the answer is, the answer is even yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, you, you've talked um, 
Brits are beginning the sort of rallying call about this, you know, arm in arm together to make this club successful. But realistically, how can you do that with the the selling shareholders still there on the board? What happens, for instance, if the trust does go ahead with legal action against them? And you know, you've heard the question marks on the integrity of these people. That I, I'm given to understand that two former directors that got removed upon your arrival uh, have taken the club to a tribunal. Given the backdrop, that legal backdrop, how can we all work together? I'm going to put it another way. I don't see how we can not work together. I just don't see it. I, I don't see it the same way. We all want the best for this football club. How can we not work together? I, I just don't, I'm sorry, I just don't see it. I see it completely the opposite. We all want the same thing. We want this club to stay in the Premier League. We want this club to grow. We want this club to prosper. There's no other way. What's the long-term future for Hugh Jenkins? Because obviously he's made a hell of a lot of money. Um, you know, is he just here on a short-term thing, just um, to smooth it over for a couple of years and then going to retire into the sunset? I mean. Can you sack him in theory? Because obviously you are the majority shareholders. Um, what is he going to be here long term? Do you think? Hot <laughs> <laughs> uh, potato. I, I, look, I'm going to give. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. I, you know, I've now worked with you for, I've known him for a year. Um, I've enjoyed working with him. He cares about the club deeply. Is not all his decisions are right decisions. Not all my decisions are right decisions. Not all Jason's are either. But he cares deeply about the club. Uh, I agree with what Jason said earlier. I think he was instrumental in getting the club to where it is. Um, we've all made mistakes along the way. But you is our long-term partner. And I've enjoyed working with him. He's been very open to new ideas. And he's been great to work with. So the answer is yes, I expect you to be here a long time. Oh, hi there. Um, just to cover sort of a topic that kind of come to you earlier, um, when you mentioned that you were at this stage of being or taken over the club, um, you mentioned that you um, sell shareholders after you opt to engage with the, with the trust. Um, long shot, are you able to name those two shareholders? Um, and B, did that not raise alarm bells with you with regards to, is this an underhand going on here? I, I will tell you this, I don't think my perspective on it at the time uh, was that they weren't sure they really wanted to sell and they didn't know if we had a, were going to come to terms on a suitable arrangement and they didn't want it in the media and I think they felt like, and I don't want to speak put words in their mouth, but the sense I got was they said, listen, before we ever transact, we, you're going to have to spend months talking with the, with the trust. But let's not put this in the newspaper, because there had been a prior potential transaction that I think that had gotten a lot of media attention locally. And what they told me was, listen, let's figure out if there's any terms that would make sense for, for you to come on board. And if we arrive at a, a potential opportunity and solution where you might come on board. Before we commit to it, you need to meet the, the members of the Supporters Trust. Um, and I took that at face value and went through the process of investigating the club and learning more about it, coming to some matches, um, talking with Steve about the opportunity. And when we thought we were close to uh, putting something on paper, making an investment in the club, we, we all stopped and we met with the Trust. I just uh, probably from a trust perspective, and this one I don't necessarily want to curtail all questions on the, the ownership, but I, I think in fairness to Steve and Jason, they obviously their, their viewpoint in terms of why they kept this out of the transaction and early doors. So I just want to remember, maybe, maybe we can move on to yeah. sort of future yeah. subject. It, 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 yeah, it's a valid point. I, I mean, from my point of view, I completely understand the feelings are running high, etc. I'm just sort of trying to keep the Discussion flowing perhaps. Five more minutes still. Okay. So maybe we can have perhaps two more questions, perhaps. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome guys. Um, 
First of all, I'm looking forward to coming to Santa Monica. Uh, <laughs> one of your parties. So I've already bought that one. I'm waiting for him to go off for the private jet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and fill some of those uh, trust pay. <laughs> um, a quick one around, um, somebody mentioned earlier about um, the fact that um, you wanted to add value. And naturally, as any businessman, um, the long term aim normally is to make money. I know you said when you first took uh, the club on that that wasn't your biggest priority. But where do you see the opportunity in three, five years' time, whatever the exit plan is? Firstly, to where do you make your money out of it? Because I don't think there's anyone who would begrudge you making money if you made the club successful. Um, and um, to ask quite a crass question, is there a plan over the next few years to take dividends of the club or consultancy fees of the type we've seen from other ownership, um, other American ownership, without trying to um, stereotype? Um, is, is that something that's on the agenda? Or? Well, we're certainly, there's no plan to take dividends this season. Uh, moving forward, our, and, and even beyond that, moving forward, our plan is to grow the value of this club. Uh, what does that mean? It means number one performance on the pitch. It means enhancing its, its, its reputation, its culture, um, its recognition both here and abroad. Uh, it means uh, having a great partnership with our ownership partners. Um, and it means that whenever the moment comes in the future, hopefully it's a very long time, uh, we, we look back and say we, we, we're leaving this club in, much, in a much better place even than when we found it. And if that happens, if those things happen, I think we'll all be happy um, and we'll all prosper in terms of the success that this club has. So that's really our plan. Um, you know, I've been involved in, in professional sports teams and management and ownership. Um, for quite a while in different leagues. And I love the competition. I love the engagement that a community has in a sports club. Uh, this one is very special and unique to its fans, to its supporters. Um, and the reward we're gonna get is if we can continue to have greater success. So that's, that's really our focus. Gentlemen, um, hopefully we'll uh, end up on a bit more of an upbeat note now. Uh, in the short term, success in the next eight games is the important thing. Uh, I hope we play on our practice football, but getting there that counts in the short term. Just going on to, to marketing, there's three things about this club I think that, that are USPs. One is what we've got here, which is the community support and ownership, which is unique, I think, in the uh, Premier League for this club. Secondly, we're a Welsh club, something that may be marketed in America and elsewhere uh, to Welsh antecedents. And the, th and the third thing is the Swansea way of playing football. And we have uh, lacked success when we deviated away from the Swansea way of playing which managers were appointed because they were in tune with the Swansea way of playing. So basically my, my question is, what is your vision for the club on the field? And do you still wholly support the Swansea way of playing? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that attracted us to the club because, and I think, it, and I think it, it, it also goes to how we recruit players because we need to recruit players that fit our system. Someone might be a, a good footballer, uh, but doesn't doesn't play well in our style. So part of our process needs to be finding players who can play well within our style, and uh, and that's attractive. Football, uh, passing football, uh, and it's a style of football that I believe Paul Clements wants to play, and um, it may not be perfectly attractive for the next eight games because we're fighting for our very survival. Um, but yes, absolutely, 100%. Uh, the, the Swansea way, uh, the style of play, the attractive style, uh, you know, not playing direct football, kicking, you know, like it's done in the championship, kicking the ball the length of the field with you know, you know a bunch of six foot five guys trying to you know block the ball. That's that's not how we're going to play football. Let me just say. Um, but there is one six foot five guy on our team right now that we really need. <laughs> yeah, 
I just want I just want to say thank you. I believe that was the last question. It, it's it's really been an honor to be here, uh, to face many of you for the first time, to see some familiar faces that I've seen around the Liberty, um, and I'm hopeful we can do this again in the future. And whether it's an upbeat question or a tough question or a tough comment, I, we want to hear them all because uh, you're never going to be. 100% happy with everything that we do. I can promise you that. But I, I want you to know from our hearts and from our minds that we're here uh, in, in unison with you to see this club succeed um, and that sometimes we need to be in a room like this, the shareholders, the people who care most passionately about the club, to air our differences and to air our grievances. Um, and I want us to come out of here tonight more united than we were, uh, to take on these next eight matches together. Um, to be ready for the future in this off season and to next season together, um, and to have more forums like this where, where you can complain about things you don't like and we can complain right back at you because we all care so passionately about this club and we want to see it succeed. So I just wanted to thank you because it was really an awesome and, and inspiring experience for me to be here with you. That, that you guys have taken tonight and the questions you, you've put to him. I, I know there was a, you know, some, some, still some um, high feelings in terms of the way that the shares were, were purchased, etc. And you know, I think you heard from both Steve and Jason that you know, agreed to, to, to look at that game at the end of the season. That the focus for everyone involved in the football club at the moment undoubtedly is the eight games we've got remaining this season. Um, you know, we are not safe yet, we need to get enough points and that starts tomorrow. So all, all I'd ask of anybody at this point in time is let's just all be together for those eight games. 